Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Good morning. Uh, morning, Pastor Roshan. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Pastor. Thank you. How are you doing? Good to have you all uh, connect, connecting to this week's mentoring hour. Uh, I'll be hosting today's session. And uh, as always, uh, we have an awesome panel of, of teachers who will be uh, more than happy to answer your questions. Um, and I also be the first one to admit that some of the questions absolutely scared me. <laughs> but uh, just uh, huge kudos to the teachers who uh, have awesome answers. Um, so feel free to post your questions in the chat section, uh, questions on uh, on discipleship or just anything based on the uh, on the Bible and how you can grow spiritually. Um, so yes, the time is all yours. Please feel free to. Go ahead and ask your questions in the task section, and uh, we'll get started with the session. OK, so we have the first question uh, from John Paul. OK, so, excuse me. My son just decided to walk in. OK, you got it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> hey, hi, hi, Ethan. How are you? OK, you can say hi. Hey, hi. <laughs> just woke up. <laughs> okay. Uh, can, can you call her mama? It's, can I, it's like one minute. I'll go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. Oh, yeah, right. I'll fill in for you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Um, so, first question is uh, John Paul shares a question. If a pastor is earning, where should his tithe go uh, to his own ministry or to the home church? Okay, interesting. A interesting question. Um, and I, uh, maybe I, you know, uh, I, I would, I would, uh, my my, you know, one sentence answer would be to uh, he should give it to where the Lord, uh, you know. Uh, leads him to do it but i can just give you my own experience uh, while i was uh, in the us uh, so i was uh, i was in that kind of a situation where um, i was working i was earning and uh, we were actually had a ministry incorporated in the us and also we were at that time uh, we were supporting about 21 pastors in india and at the same time, I was serving in a local church as a volunteer, like I was just helping the pastor there. So I was in the same dilemma in the sense that where should my tithe go? Um, because I had a ministry, it was called Frontier Missions Initiative, uh, mainly a missions ministry that was incorporated in the US and through which we were supporting pastors and doing conferences and all. Uh, but also I was, you know, a regular member in a, a part of a local church. So. Now, initially, what happened was I, I used to use my tithe and give it to uh, put it into front emissions in order to support the pastors in India because it was a commitment. And uh, initially, those days, you know, basically it was the tithe that I was getting that I was sending uh, to support the pastors in India. And uh, then, you know, there were you know there were a few others who would give small contributions, and all of that would go to help people in India. So I, I, for me, the pressure was if I don't put my tithe into you know, my front emissions, I, I won't be able to keep my commitment in India. I won't be able to support those pastors. So that was my pressure, my dilemma. And then, so, I, uh, but at the same time, I, I used to teach, right? Your tithe goes to your local church. So that was what I was teaching, but then I, I I was becoming convicted that I was I myself was not practicing that. Uh, I used to justify myself by saying, "Hey, in any way, it's going to you know, it's going for a good thing. It's going to serve pastors. Uh, it's going to help pastors in India." So I used to justify myself, and I went on like that. Maybe, yeah, I don't know for, I, I think uh, at least two years I went on like that. Uh, but then at some point, I felt convicted, deeply convicted that, hey. Uh, I am telling people that your tithe should go to your local church, wherever you are. 
but uh, I myself am not doing it. I mean, I know I'm giving it to the house of God in the sense I'm supporting pastors in India, but right now, I, at that time, I was in Chicago. Uh, so at that time, I said, so look, I'm part of a local church in Chicago, so I should be giving my tithe here. So one month, finally, I decided, I said, God, I'm going to trust you. From this month, I'm going to put my tithe, which was a substantial amount. I was going to put, I'm going to put my tithe into my local church, which means that huge amount suddenly goes away from Frontier Missions. It's no longer there. But I still have the commitment to support. Uh, I think it was at least 21 pastors or the numbers were increasing. So I don't know what the numbers were at that time. But I still had to send money to India to support, you know, this many pastors. But I'm trusting you. You know, and so that month when I when I uh, decided to do that, I, I gave my tithe to my local church. From now on, I'm going to do this. Uh, but God was so faithful that there were other people, you know, just raised up. I don't know how and where, um, I mean, in the U.S., who started sending money to Frontier Missions. And we never failed in our commitment to support the pastors in India till we returned back. So... You know, I, I'm just sharing that personal example that, uh, you know, uh, that was some, a learning for me as well uh, in just obeying God and saying, okay, I'll give my tithe to my local church wherever I am. And uh, whatever other ministry I have to do, God will, you know, uh, provide for that and trust him for that. So my simple answer is do what God puts in your heart. And uh, But what we do teach and preach is that, uh, you know, the, whichever local church you are, you give your tithe there. I hope that helps, John. Yeah, yes, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I'm back to you, Roshan. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for stepping in. Uh, all right. Uh, do we have any more questions? Please keep sending in your questions. So we have one from Divya. Uh, the question means, what does mountain of God refer to? Uh, this came in the dream, but unable to figure out what it means. Okay, uh, what does a mountain of God? Uh, first, of all, I only know that Zion in the Bible is referred to as the mountain of God. Uh, yes, uh, would any of the, the pastors would like to respond to this question? Uh, yeah, give an explanation of your understanding. Okay. Um, so, Devi, in scripture, you find that mountain is, uh, you find typology. Typology means uh, these images that mean something. So, one of the meanings of the typo, the image of a mountain, it refers to a kingdom, right? And this you get from Daniel chapter 2, uh, uh, Daniel chapter 2. Uh, where uh, the king uh, Nebuchadnezzar sees a dream and he sees a huge mountain. Uh, and uh, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 35, it says, the stone struck and became a great mountain, filled the whole earth. And then he goes on to explain that the mountain actually refers to, um, uh, uh, verse 44, Daniel 2, 44, the mountain actually refers to uh, the kingdom of God. So Daniel 2.35 and Daniel 2.44. So in biblical typology, mountain refers to kingdom, right? And then there's another interesting, uh, other interesting passage, which is in, in Isaiah chapter 2, and also in uh, Micah chapter 4, where it talks about the mountain of the Lord's house will be established. This is Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. The mountain of the Lord's house will be established on top of the mountains. And uh, this is again uh, quoted in uh, Micah chapter 4 and verse 1. So here again, uh, the mountain refers to the kingdom of God. You know, the, the, the house of the Lord will be uh, greater and more powerful than all other kingdoms. So to answer your question, a mountain typically refers to uh, the kingdom of God. And then as uh, Pastor Roshan also mentioned, uh, mountain also refers, like Mount Zion, it refers to the people of God. Uh, 
So Mount Zion uh, in the Old Testament refers, uh, you know, it was actually a little mountain, but later on, as you come into the uh, prophets, the you know, so Isaiah and Ezekiel and so on, uh, they they use the phrase Mount Zion to refer to people, the people of God. So initially, it started in the book of Samuel. Mount Zion was a literal mountain on which out, uh, David established the city of Jerusalem, around which he established the city of Jerusalem. So it was an actual place. But then the phrase Mount Zion came on to refer to the people of God, and it continued on into the New Testament. In uh, Hebrews 12, it's used again to refer to the people of God. So if it is Mount Zion, people of God, mountain, kingdom. Is that okay? Okay, okay. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Devia. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, okay. All right, uh, we have another question from John. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, we see Paul mentioning that uh, he delivered Hymenaeus and Alexander to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. What would have been the necessity of this? Can a person in spiritual authority do that? Right. Uh, let me just go through that question one more time. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, we see Paul mentioning that he delivered Hymenaeus and Alexander to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Uh, what would have been the necessity of this? That's part one. Can a person in spiritual authority do that? Uh, Pastor Nancy, would you like to respond to this question, please? Uh, yes, yes, Pastor Roshan. Um, uh, so, uh, John, um, what what i understand is that uh, you know paul uh, would have definitely done his part to uh, bring correction okay and in a in a loving way to these people that he is mentioning here by name however you know we see uh, we see a certain progression that is um, advised in scripture you know as given in matthew 18 the way you know one must go and uh, uh, c bring correction to someone who has who has wronged them uh, and also you know as spiritual leaders um, scriptures tell us that we who are spiritual uh, that that we must uh, bring correction you know in a, in a gentle way to somebody who has uh, wandered away uh, so uh, i believe that paul would have done uh, the needful in in this case however um, uh, if people were unrelenting uh, you know um, even this is something that he would have he would have uh, written out of his love for them uh, that you know uh, now that people are not listening uh, let them learn on their own so uh, in in that sense is what i believe paul is writing this uh, that uh, hopefully you know they they will uh, learn through their experience and you know their their uh, relationship with God. Uh, so I think I'll just leave it at at that, uh, John. Uh, that that is as much as I know. Maybe Pastor could uh, uh, share. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to add to uh, what Nancy shared, um, you know, we we read about a similar thing in um, a similar instance in one Corinthians fifteen. Uh, sorry, one Corinthians five. Um, where uh, Paul says, you know, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5, um, he's talking about somebody who's sexually immoral and having an immoral lifestyle. In fact, it's a uh, incestuous uh, lifestyle. And um, in verse 5, he says, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of uh, the Lord Jesus. So we see that, uh, um, you know, that uh, that there was a, you know, we see that uh, happening there. And um, and in this case, we see that um, it's a lifestyle. It's a continuing lifestyle. And uh, it is uh, not only um, affecting that person, but it's also affecting the, the body of believers. Like if you read uh, verse 7, it says, Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Uh, and also verse 6, sorry. Your glorifying is not good. Do you not know that a little uh, leaven leavens the whole lump? So there's, it's a you know, uh, negative or um, unrighteous influence on the whole body. And it's a serious thing. You know, the body of Christ is holy, is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and uh, um, so um, so it's affecting all the other believers as well. So so he he um, so he, he goes on to explain what that delivering is also delivering to Satan, like putting out of fellowship 
of uh, the community of believers. You know, they, they, he's put out of uh, fellowship. Uh, in, in other words, like we would we could say, probably excommunicated from the church, from the body of believers for a season, so that that person might, um, you know, learn um, and um, come to a place of repentance and come back. And then we read in Second Corinthians, we see that that has happened. So, um, so it's in a very extreme uh, case, but um, you know, that's that's what it is. So even in First Timothy chapter one and verse twenty, um, so these. Um, these two um, people, Hymenaeus and Alexander, are you know continuing to blaspheme. So he's saying you know that they may learn not to blaspheme, and uh, it's putting out of fellowship of the community of believers and distancing oneself, so that they may learn, come to a place of repentance, and then you know uh, be restored again. Yeah, um, Pastor, uh, you want to add something to it? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, um, both uh, uh, Pastor Nancy and Pastor Sigma covered, uh, you know, the, the core, the me, the core meaning of uh, these passages. And uh, uh, what I just want to add is that, uh, in some sense, there is a, a, a spiritual, um, a spiritual leaders do have a spiritual oversight uh, over the people entrusted to them. Right, so you we have this word overseer. So Acts uh, twenty verse twenty eight, and also in uh, Hebrews thirteen, I think it's verse uh, fifteen. Let me give you the exact verse. Hebrews thirteen. Mm, um, uh, what's that? Um, uh, 17, Hebrews 13, 17. So Acts 20, 28, Hebrews 13, 17 is talking about uh, 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 spiritual oversight. So that means there is this aspect of uh, protective uh, protection, spiritual protection that comes through the spiritual oversight of the leaders who are watching over your souls. Uh, and so in a sense, that by you know by when paul says i'm handing this person over uh, they are no longer going to be under the spiritual oversight and the spiritual protection that comes from the leadership over the people whom the holy spirit has uh, appointed them uh, which makes them in some way vulnerable even more vulnerable than uh, others to demonic uh, you know whatever the enemy wants to do so that's why he's saying I'm handing them over to Satan. You know, that means Satan's going to be you know, do things because first of all they're in rebellion against God, which automatically opens them up to the enemy. Uh, and secondly, is that as as a leader, Paul is choosing to withdraw his spiritual oversight over those individuals. Um, and there's that aspect. Right? I, I don't want to magnify that too much, but then that is a reality uh, with the we see in scripture. The reason I don't want to magnify that too much is because then people get into the extreme of uh, spiritual covering and shepherding and all of that, uh, which again is, uh, you know, like you're falling into the other side of the ditch. So we don't want to magnify that too much, but then that's a reality we have to understand uh, in its own context. Um, yeah, so that's the only thing I would add. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, pastors. Thank you, everybody, for responding and uh, well, Sorry, one more, uh, Roshan. I just going back to Divya's uh, earlier question about mountain. I just re realized that uh, you know uh, the mountain could also uh, uh, the the typology of the mountain could also be that of uh, an obstacle, right? Uh, that's from uh, what Jesus said in Matthew in his teaching on faith. Uh, Whoever says to this mountain, "Be thou removed," so while uh, the typology one of the images uh, mountain refers to the kingdom. That's from Daniel 2, 35 and 44. Uh, the other typology of the mountain also refers to an obstacle. You know, if you say to the mountain, be removed. So I just wanted to, I just, it just came to mind afterwards. Okay, Divya, just, that. thanks. Yeah. yeah, Pastor, can I, can I add something? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was mountain of God. And the reference that you gave me on Daniel 2, um, it was a confirmation as well. So yeah, yeah, I just wanted to. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Divya. Okay. Uh, right now, we have a question from Sid. Um, he says, Pastor, as we are celebrating Diwali today, and I do have some Hindu friends, is it okay if I go and celebrate with them? But uh, my one Christian friend, he says that don't go out today for it is Evil Spirits Festival. Don't step out. Pastor, so what should I do? Uh, one is my church friend and, and the Hindu friends are my college classmates. Um, what can Sid do in a situation like this? Oh, any one of us, this can happen to any one of us, right? So uh, Pastor Paul, uh, would you like to shed some light on that, please? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure, Roshan. Uh, thank you, Sid, for the question. Uh, okay, I'll give a very, very practical answer. Uh, now, you've mentioned here, uh, said that you, you know, you know, go and celebrate with them. Now, I'm not sure what is what comes under celebrate, uh, but uh, we know that Diwali is a big festival in our nation, and uh, you know, uh, it's called the Festival of Lights and all of these things of crackers, bursting crackers, and all of it. Uh, now, if it's like very practical, like even you know, probably me growing up, um, you know, we would get together with friends and burst crackers, but I had no idea what the what Diwali is like in in context of their festival. Like, what is it all about? It was only about like you know, bursting crackers or enjoying with friends. Now, uh, if if you're mentioning about you know, anyway, now the government has banned crackers and all of that but uh but if it's something like just being with your friends and spending time with friends uh um you're not really celebrating diwali but you're just spending time with your friends uh but you know when you go into the details in the sense that you you, you know you uh you involve in their you know their worship or their times of prayers or whatever they're doing uh now th that would be wrong uh, but, uh, you know, you can go out, there's evil spirits there every day, uh, not only on Diwali. So you can go out, you, it gives you all the more reason for you to, you know, spread your uh, light to others. Um, I just wanted to share this one instant. It happened maybe in 2017 or uh, where we went out, uh, you know, a lot of friends, Hindu friends, we went out, it was on Diwali. And you know, I, they all busted crackers and all of that. And we were there. Uh, but I remember asking this friend, I, I think I shared this in the lifestyle evangelism class, uh, just asking your friend, um, uh, are you happy after the festival? Uh, you know, after the whole day, I asked him, are you happy that you bursted crackers and enjoyed yourself? Uh, he said no. And so it was an opportunity for me to share the gospel with him. And uh, that same night he accepted Christ. But, so if I had said to myself, okay, this is an evil spirits festival and not gone with them, I wouldn't have got the opportunity to share the gospel with them. So, uh, so just to, uh, you know, just to make the right perspective to my answer, if it's something to just, which is not involving worship of their, of their God uh, and their worship of their, uh, whatever they're doing, and if it's just being with friends, spending time together, I think it's all right. Uh, and, uh, you know, don't worry about the evil spirits. Uh, there are plenty of scriptures which say that, you know, uh, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And uh, God has given you the authority uh, above these evil spirits. So you can go ahead, spend time with them, share the gospel with them, be a testimony to them. Uh, but avoid, you know, uh, worship of what they are doing. So I, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, maybe one of the other staff can also share. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Sure. Thank uh, you, Pastor Paul. Yes, Pastor Nancy, please go ahead. Yes, yes. Thank you, for, uh, uh, Pastor Paul. Thank you for that. And uh, I think uh, Pastor Paul has made it very clear uh, that we can't engage in worship, right? Or uh, apart from worshiping uh, the living God, we mustn't engage in worship of uh, anyone or anything else. I just want to add to what he uh, shared. Uh, so uh, this happens to a lot of us. Uh, we 
some because we have friends of other faiths we get invited for uh, dinners and you know lunches and things like that so there are two portions of scripture that i felt like sharing one is from first corinthians 10 uh, verses 27 through 31 basically that that says that if somebody invites you uh, and you know that they are partaking of uh, they they are involving in worship of of uh, some other god uh, the good thing to do is to uh, not uh, ask you know whether the food was um, uh, dedicated to those other gods to just uh, go ahead if they've invited you for dinner you just quietly go and uh, you know uh, have the dinner uh, but if you do come to know that the food was dedicated to uh, you know some other god for their conscience sake you know paul writes and says that uh, it's better that you don't take it because then you know you you stand out as a witness and as a testimony to um, uh, the worship of the living god so you know that that is something i wanted to say and also i know romans 14 23 uh, it says that whatever is not a faith is sin so uh, just to just to go by our conscience also you know if there's anything that makes you uncomfortable like if you're invited for for something like this and anything that makes you uncomfortable just don't do that Okay. So uh, uh, whatever you do, if you're able to do that out of faith, that's fine. But uh, if anything makes you uncomfortable and doubt, then uh, don't do that. So just wanted to add these two uh, passages as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, thank you, Sid, once again for that question. I hope uh, they were able to answer your question. Uh, okay. So moving on, uh, we have a question from Diana Thalur. Roslyn, I see that you raised your hand. Uh, can we get to it after we respond to uh, Elisha's questions? Okay, we'll get to you after we respond. Okay. Right. Uh, so, Diana Thor has posted a question saying, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Uh, believe his prophets and you shall prosper. It's from Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. Uh, Diana has uh, asked us to expand on this. Uh, I'd like to read that scripture one more time uh, from, from Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. I want to read verse 19 as well, just so we understand the context. It says so, and some Levites of the Kohathites and Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe and remain steadfast to his prophets and you shall prosper. Right. Uh, can I request one of our pastors to uh, respond to that, please? Right, uh, Pastor Ashish, would you like to just uh, give your thoughts on that, please? Yeah, so um, uh, it's just um, Second Chronicles twenty twenty. Um, Diana is just uh, encouraging us to uh, believe the uh, prophetic word, uh, you know, that God releases through uh, by His Spirit through human vessels. Of course, uh, we have to look at things from the New Testament, but this, uh, Second Chronicles twenty twenty is an Old Testament scripture. Uh, its application has to be in New Testament context. So, in New Testament context, what do we understand about prophecy and the role of the prophetic? You know, so, we know that there is the gift of prophecy, which can all flow through every believer, and the prophetic. There are there are people who are called to be prophets uh, in the prophetic office, but the New Testament teaches us to test all things. So First Thess Thessalonians 5, 21, uh, it says, uh, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast to what is good. So that's the first thing. So regardless of who speaks what, uh, we don't blindly believe a prophet or a prophecy. Everything, both the prophet and the prophecy have to be tested. The prophet has to be tested to make sure he's a good tree uh, bring forth good fruit. 
and the prophecy has to be tested making sure that it is aligned to the word of god and aligned to what god is speaking to you personally ultimately uh, first john 2 27 the anointing who abides in us teaches us all things and we live by the anointing uh, the guidance of the anointing within us so that's the first thing and uh, we do keep in mind that not everything a prophet says is prophetic right because a prophet is just a human person doesn't mean everything that comes out of his mouth is prophetic no uh, it's only when he speaks under the inspiration of the holy spirit that that's prophetic all the other is just normal conversation so uh, the answer to that is uh, we have to believe the prophetic word like uh, paul told timothy first timothy 1 18 he says you know uh, by the prophecies that went out before you wage a good warfare you know so the the, the prophecies the prophetic word is important we have to give it it its rightful place in our lives uh you know revelation uh 19 1911 i think it says you know the testimony of jesus is the spirit of prophecy so really uh, the spirit of prophecy is testifying to christ and from christ so it is jesus speaking to the church so we have to take it with reverence, but it has to be tested first and then pursued. Is that okay, Diana? Anything specific? Okay. Yeah. Diana, uh, I hope you're there. Okay, I hope we were able to answer that question for you. Thank you for that question. Um, moving on to Elisha's question, we have, uh, so he's asking us, is it right for a Christian to engage in the USA diversity visa lottery and any other game of chance? Okay, uh, that's the first time I'm hearing that. Is uh, Elisha, thank you for that question. Is it... Uh, a lottery kind of thing is is that what it is yes pastor is a lottery kind of kind of thing okay all right so uh the question is um is it right for a christian a christian to engage uh, in a game of chance which is lotteries etc so um pastor jay kumar would you like to respond to this please yeah, Roshan. Um, yeah, first of all, um, yeah, this uh, game of chance, like it's like lottery or like gambling, right? It's um, uh, I, uh, I've uh, I've heard of um, you know people's testimonies saying that it, it's very addictive um, and also it um, it's a sure shot way of losing uh, losing hard earned wealth. So that's one of the downsides of it. Um, like apart from that, it it has um, you know other uh, evils as well, uh, like fueling greed uh, without um, you know without effort or without hard work put in. Um, so those are two things that uh, I can like at the top of my head think of. You know, like one is uh, greed and uh, uh, you know um, uh, earning something without uh, uh, without working for it or. Uh, productive work um, and also the other evils uh, connected with it like um, it is addictive and uh, you know it's um, um, like when you look at some of the details of gambling it's it's uh, gambling or lottery it's it's designed in such a way that um, the percentage of winning is very very margin of winning is very 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 thin you know, very small so the majority would stand to lose and it's uh, it's uh i mean it's it's, a, it's an evil uh which we we can avoid um yeah that's what i i can think of uh, thank you thank you pastor james uh pastor paul would you like to uh add to it as well uh yes Ocean, i'm not really sure uh about the uh, you know the U.S. diversity visa lottery. Uh, uh, what I would say is, I just echo what Pastor Jake said uh, that you know it's uh, it is a very addictive addictive uh, thing to play to you know to you know maybe uh, you know there are times when uh, uh, I think nowadays you know uh, you go 
to the supermarket and you purchase some things and they give you this card you just fill it up you put it in the box and then there's this whole lottery system where they pick it up and the winner gets a gift now Graphic. that is yeah yeah something like that uh, but that is uh, i think that is okay because you're not uh, but uh, you know you're just filling up that and giving it uh I'd, i but if you like how pastor jake said it it was it's if it's something that your mind is set on and if if you always keep thinking about it okay this is mo- money that i want to get it fuels greed it fuels uh, you know uh, wrong motives to uh, get money and could be very addictive as well so uh, uh so uh, uh, regarding the other the us diversity lottery visa i'm not really sure about that so i'll leave it at that yeah. thanks roshan right. thanks thank you pastor paul thank you pastor jake okay uh Elisha, I hope uh, we were able to answer your question. Uh, do you have a follow-up uh, question or something that you want to share? No, Pastor. Uh, I think uh, I'm okay. I'm okay with that response. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Diana. Uh, no problem. Uh, right. uh, so is, do you have a follow-up question, Diana? Um, uh, I hope you, you were able to... Uh, listen to the responses okay. yeah just to uh, just uh, respond to that uh, yeah dana so for somebody to say that uh, prosperity came from the prophet uh, that definitely is uh, not true uh, it definitely goes against uh, the word of god and you can just uh, we can just disregard that you know that all blessings come from god and uh, you know uh, yeah not from not because of the prophet yeah awesome thank you pastor awesome. okay uh, any more questions keep the questions coming uh, but until then, I'd like to just ask a question to, uh, I mean, uh, to the panel. Uh, so, as Christian leaders, right, um, and, and being surrounded uh, by, you know, being raised in a Christian family, being surrounded by Christian leaders and whatnot, um, from my own personal journey, uh, I've seen one of the key things, which kind of uh, has affected the leaders, so to speak, over the years was uh, with something called the entitlement, and I learned I learned about that word. I mean, much later I, at that point in time, I didn't even know, you know, that it was entitlement. But um, so for us as Christian leaders and young leaders, most of us, uh, uh, you know, will be stepping into a role of leadership somewhere. Um, how dangerous it can be, uh, you know, that spirit of entitlement. So, and how can we avoid that? And what is some of the characteristics that we can just lean on to uh, keep that at bay? Anybody? Uh, yeah, Roshan, I think uh, you, you brought up um, uh, a very important uh, Theme or topic, and I and I know I I don't know if this last week or the week before, I had uh, mentioned about um, uh, the Mars Hill Church, which is just uh, you know a, um, a study that is being done by Christianity Today on on what was happening, uh, like uh, which you know they they're just referring to it as celebrity status of uh, pastors, Christian leaders, and then. Um, and I just, you know, and I'm just sharing this. On, I'm sharing this here on, 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 uh, on, on. Uh, I was actually going to send an email to our own pastoral team and church office and so on, but uh, I'll just share this here on this chat here. Uh, that uh, just, you know, less than a month ago, or let's say two months ago, September, this was um, uh, 60 minutes Australia. You know, brought out this video on Hillsong, uh, where. And again, this is not to put Hillsong down, but I, you know, and God has blessed the church through Hillsong, and, um, and we will continue to sing their songs and all of that. But uh, I'm just pointing this out because this quote-unquote celebrity status of pastors—that means 
pastors feel entitled to you know having this place of being honored uh, and the, the sad thing is it's being taken to the to an extreme now we are hearing about you know we're hearing about uh, churches in the western world but the fact is even in india uh, in many parts of our own country uh, uh, Pastors feel entitled to be, you know, held in certain honor, certain respect, and given certain privileges. Uh, they think like, you know, there is God, there are pastors, and then there are the people, <laughs> you know. And 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 and, and we, what we are seeing, you know, in 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 in, the, you know, we are seeing the repercussions of this kind of thing in the Western world, uh, which of course is happening even in our own country. So entitlement means. I feel that I deserve that, you know, I'm entitled to it because maybe I'm making so many so much spiritual sacrifices. Maybe I'm praying so much. Maybe I am, uh, maybe I am, uh, you know, whatever, as a spiritual leader and I deserve my title, I deserve my role. I deserve, you know, a certain status, but then that sense of entitlement leads people to do a lot of strange things, uh, which actually contradicts the word of God, Christian leaders I'm talking about. Like you know, if you look, watch this documentary from his, uh, from 60 Minutes Australia, uh, the the pastors were living lavish lifestyles, using church money. They felt entitled to it, you know, just just celebrity. They they were living like celebrities, uh, using church money. And so that's you know that's what where entitlement will eventually take us, you know. And uh, then pastors were protecting pastors. Even when they were doing wrong, they were sinning, they were sexually abusing people. And uh, it, is, it is happening because it's now, you know, a whole culture of celebrity culture. You have to protect each other, you have to protect that, you know, the pastoral status. So uh, to answer your question, uh, it, it is a very dangerous thing, that sense of entitlement, that because I'm pastor or because I'm spiritual leader, I have deserved this. You know, it's very dangerous uh, thinking and a dangerous attitude, which then leads to a lot of these kinds of things that we're seeing happening in, in church life. Uh, I think the antidote to that is uh, just telling us that we're all on level ground. That means every believer, uh, whether you're a pastor or a prophet or an apostle, or you're a new believer, we all stand on level ground before God. You know, we're all saved by grace through faith. We all read the same Bible. We're all washed in the same blood and we're all filled with the same Holy Spirit. And, uh, and we have to see our call uh, to pastoring or leadership more as a responsibility rather than a status. You know, and if we do that, then we will avoid the sense of entitlement, which leads us to, which leads leaders to do wrong things. And, and we have to constantly remind us, look, as a pastor, I'm actually the least of all. I'm a servant. Uh, I'm here to serve. And my call as a pastor or as a leader is really a responsibility that I'm fulfilling uh, to serve people. Yeah, sorry for bringing up uh, yeah. all the bad things, but <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but uh, it did really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Uh, so just before we go to uh, Divya's question, as a, just a follow up, right? I mean, this is again open to all our pastors. Um, so that question was from a perspective of uh, a leader, but then also, and I think uh, what simply put the question as a follow up is I want to understand the difference between honor and worship because uh, i think we as indians it's a I think it's a very cultural thing to us as we like to worship everything or anything <laughs> uh you know the sun moon stars water or rocks or whatnot but um so and again in that same journey i felt like okay it is the people who gave uh you know the leaders this kind of authority or that they place them on a pedestal which should not have happened um so again now from the perspective of the congregation or just uh, people uh how do we draw the line or understand the difference between honoring yes we need to honor the men of god uh, and how do we understand that we don't have to worship them just a quick thing 
Yeah, it's a good question. I think honor should be held uh, similarly. Like I honor the past uh, the way I honor my parents. You know, same thing. The Bible tells me to honor my parents. The same honor, the same kind of honor I give to the past. Uh, so I don't put parents on a pedestal, and, you know, make them next to God. No, I honor them because of what they've done in my life and because of, you know, their advance in wisdom, their, you know, their, their age and so on. So I honor. Uh, similarly, I honor the pastor. But I don't make my honor cause me to just give that person free access into my life. You know, uh, I honor, I respect, but that doesn't mean we worship. That doesn't mean we let that person dominate our lives, control our lives, dictate our lives. Those are things we don't do. So, you know, so I think that word honor should be, you know, held within its context when we relate, whether it's parents, whether it's pastors, whether it's government leaders. You know, we honor. The Bible tells us to honor everyone. In fact, the Bible tells us to honor the brotherhood. You know, First Peter two. Um, that means we honor each other. So the same same thing applies not only to parents, government, pastors, but to one another. We honor. You know. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, right, okay, so uh, we'll quickly get to Divya's question. Uh, so Divya has asked us a question from Matthew chapter sixteen, verse eighteen and nineteen. It says, "And I tell you that you are Peter." And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Um, right, can I uh, request any one of our pastors to uh, just expand on this first, please? And uh, the via, so uh, sorry, Pastor Nancy, to have interrupted. Um, so, uh, which particular section of the verse would you like a detailed explanation, Divya? Uh, yeah, I was just looking at the, uh, you know, the context of that verse as well. Like Peter was asked, uh, "Who do you say I am?" And why was Jesus saying that at that time, point of time, to Peter? Um, and I understand that it is the authority that is being spoken about. Uh, yeah, but I just want to know the pastor's perspective on this. Okay. Right. Thank you, Tavia. Yes. Uh, pastor Nancy, if you... Uh, yes, yes, Pastor Roshan. So, uh, Divya, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, when Jesus says that on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Uh, the rock that he's talking about, as you rightly pointed out, you know, Jesus was asking um, the question, uh, uh, you know, to, um, yeah, uh, to him uh, saying you know what do you, who do you say i am and simon peter answered you are the messiah the son of the living god so uh when jesus says on this rock uh he meant on the revelation that he is the christ the church will be built so you know that that is one aspect of it and the second uh, aspect here is uh you know him saying that i will give you the keys of the kingdom we know that you know, he had the authority uh, as a son of god and he's saying that he would give it to um, the believers uh, so that we can uh, allow the things here on earth which are allowed in the kingdom of heaven and similarly disallow things which uh, are not allowed in heaven uh, so you know things like uh, you know god's god's um, working god's rule and reign uh, the the features of the kingdom the joy the peace uh, the power of god the presence of god those are things that we are love and whatever the enemy does, we go against that you know, oppression sickness those are the things that we bind or we we uh, kind of you know don't let let that happen uh, in our lives so those are the key points from these uh, from from uh, this passage divya does that answer your question though yeah yeah thank you thank you oh, so okay, much okay, yes, thank you thank, thank you. you so much thank you pastor nancy uh, just to quickly add uh, to to the you know this passage uh, the geographical setting of this has always fascinated me and this happens in philippi Caesarea philippi right which is in the northern part of israel just up after galilee um, 
and so this place about it's just below the mount hermon and so there's a lot of dew that comes down as water and this so there's this constant flow of water and whatnot and um it's filled with rocks and this region was was extremely prohibited for Jews to go because of the malpractices, all the evil practices that used to happen at that region. Uh, talk about uh, a, a lot of evil things, a lot of disgusting things you would happen there. And so it was, it was, it was like a no the red zone for any Jew to enter there. And apparently, Jesus takes these disciples and he goes there and he shows them all these gods made of all these rocks and wood and whatnot. Uh, and there would be a, like a cave. Uh, you know, and and which was again filled with water if you, when you go in, and that was known as a gate uh, to the dark world or the underworld, uh, hence the Hades. And so he's setting up this amazing context in that place, and then he says, uh, you know, all of this will not have power, you know, the, the gates behind. So and I tell, and Peter has this amazing, uh, you know, revelation through through the Holy Spirit, and he says, and then Jesus goes on to say, on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it all, you know. So uh, it's it's a wonderful uh, geographical setting in which Jesus gives this amazing lesson. Uh, but yeah, I hope that kind of helps. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank Pastor Roshan, for thank adding you. that. Yeah. Welcome, Divya. Uh, Abraham, uh, we are out of time now. Uh, we will ask this, uh, you know, get to your question in the following week. Okay. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining in for today's mentoring hour. Uh, I hope it was a good time of learning um, and equipping. God bless you all. Uh, we'll see you again uh, next week. Okay. Take a break and have a good one. Bye bye.